Hi everyone, and welcome to week 9 of Introduction to Causal Inference. This week we'll be going through difference in differences, estimation, and synthetic controls. I'll be giving the part of the lecture on difference in differences, and it will be shorter than the lectures that we've had in the past weeks, but then we'll have a whole other lecture on synthetic controls from Alberto Abadi later in the week. Last week, with instrumental variables, we started covering some causal inference techniques from economics, and we're going to continue that this week with difference in differences. Difference in differences is a very common method that you might see used in economics or neighboring fields such as political science. As always, go ahead and leave any questions or comments that come up during the course of the lecture in the YouTube comments section down below. Here is the lecture outline. We'll start by motivating difference in differences, and then consider some necessary preliminaries. Then I'll give you an overview of the method before we jump into the formal assumptions and proof of the method. And finally, we'll cover some important problems with difference in differences. So the context for difference in differences is a bit different than what we've seen so far. Importantly, there's an aspect of time. So we'll still have a treatment group and a control group, but the treatment group won't get treatment until a certain point in time. So here we have the outcome on the y-axis and then time on the x-axis here, and the control group's outcome is going to change over time, even though we haven't given them the treatment at all. Unlike the treatment group, who will not get the treatment until a specific point in time. So they're going to be just like the control group in terms of the fact that they won't have the treatment up until this point, and then after that they will have the treatment. So the treatment's administered at a specific point in time to the treatment group, not to the control group. And the fact that we have this time dimension now is going to be helpful. So we're going to use the fact that we observe these groups over time to help us with identification. Here's a popular example from this Card and Kruger 1994 paper. They wanted to study the causal effect of increasing minimum wage on employment. So the treatment group here was New Jersey. New Jersey was going to have a new increase in minimum wage law go into effect at this specific point in time with the dotted line. And then the control group was the neighboring state, Pennsylvania, who wasn't going to have any minimum wage increase. Okay, so we see that employment in the control group in Pennsylvania is just going down over time in this graph. That shouldn't really have anything to do with the treatment because of the control group. They're not getting the treatment. And then we see that in the treatment group, we see a different trend. And we're going to use these differences in these trends to get our causal effect estimate. But before we do that, there's one important preliminary that we haven't seen yet in the course, which is the average treatment effect on the treated. So we've seen the average treatment effect, and we've seen that under the unconfoundedness assumption here, so that's where the potential outcomes are both independent of treatment. Alternatively, you could think of this as there's no backdoor path from T to Y in the causal graph. Under this assumption, we have the following identification. So we can get the average treatment effect as just the difference in these conditional expectations in the treatment group versus the control group. But there are other causal estimates to be interested in. So for example, one really common one is the average treatment effect on the treated, which we'll denote as ATT. So this is just the average treatment effect, but now we are specifically looking at the treated group. We're conditioning on t equals 1. So we don't care about the average treatment effect in the control group, if this is the estimate we're interested in. And with this estimate, we don't need to make as strong of an unconfoundedness assumption. So here we only needed to assume that the potential outcome y0 is independent of treatment, rather than both potential outcomes. And under this assumption, we have that we get the same identification. And we'll go ahead and prove that really quickly since it's only a few steps. The first step is the usual application of linearity of expectation. Then if you look at this first term, which is a causal term because it has a potential outcome in it, so y1 given t equals 1, because the potential outcome, the number in the parentheses there, 
matches the treatment that we're conditioning on, we can use consistency to just identify that. It just turns into the regular conditional expectation. We can just remove the potential outcome because we're conditioning on t equals that same value. But this second term is counterfactual. So the potential outcome y0, the 0 doesn't match the t equals 1, so it's counterfactual. Here's where we need to use our weaker unconfoundedness assumption. So because y0 is independent of treatment, we can just turn that into, we could either remove the t or we can change it to t equals 0. Here we change the conditioning to t equals 0, so then we can use consistency again to then identify this last term. And that completes the proof. This brings us to our first question, which is, what is the difference between the ATE and the ATT?